Hello, School Transportation Nation. Tony Corpin here. Excited to be at the podcast with you today. It's brought to you by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing software. Also brought to you by IC Bus and Safely. We'll be hearing a little later today, Donna Hackett, Transportation Supervisor for Pembroke Central School District in New York, one of TransFinder's top transportation team's winners. Ms. Taylor Ekbatani is going to be speaking with Donna later in the episode. Excited for that. All right. Before we get to the headlines with Ryan Gray, with a message from IC Bus. Hey guys, we've got a great tech tip this week brought to you by IC Bus. You're looking for ways to improve your on-time performance and reduce operating costs? All IC Bus CE Series school buses now come standard with factory installed telematics devices, including a five-year connectivity subscription. Customers gain access to on-command connection, an industry-leading remote diagnostic solution providing data that is visible and easy to understand and actionable. With OCC, your school district will have visibility to vehicle health and performance data at your fingertips, including EV-specific information like state of charge and estimated range. You guys can learn more about other standard capabilities of IC-connected vehicles at icbus.com. That's icbus.com. All right, we're back. Ryan, excited to be with you on the podcast today. Uh, school startup is in full swing, and man, it was a uh, it was a tough start for a lot of people. I know we saw a huge headline come out about a uh, big crash in Ohio, fatalities, injuries. Uh, really scary, Ryan, to see uh, an opening week of school and uh, such tragedy. And uh, of course that really opens up the debate of the vehicle because it did not have seat belts. And I know uh, a student was ejected. It was a rollover, a uh, really crazy kind of outcome. You want to kind of break it down for everybody? What what happened in this Ohio crash? Yeah, well, it was, it was you know, what – Student, a lot of student transporters, what uh, folks at the National Transportation Safety Board fear, as you mentioned, that rollover crash, uh, no seatbelts in this uh, Northwestern local schools uh, bus. It's uh, Western Ohio, about 30 miles northeast of Dayton, uh, Ohio. This happened Tuesday morning, last Tuesday is the first day of school. Um, like you mentioned, just a really rough way to start the the school year, kind of for the industry. I mean, we've, we've talked about uh, Jefferson County Public Schools, the problems they had a couple of weeks ago with their routing system. They delayed the start of class for a week. Now we have a fatality that happened in Ohio the same day, the same time. Um, there was a fatality in Kansas. A, a student was uh, was hit by a, a school bus uh, and killed. Um, the day before, a daycare student died uh, after being left in the van for five hours, died of heat stroke. So just a real tragic uh, start to the school year, unfortunately. In terms of Ohio, uh, what happened, apparently a, a motorist uh, crossed the center line into the path of the oncoming school bus. The school bus tried to veer out of the way. The two vehicles still struck each other. Uh, the school bus, as you mentioned, Tony, overturned, rolled over and a student was injected. 20 uh, injuries um, as well. There was one critical. I haven't seen an update on that point, but it seems that uh, that student uh, uh, may be okay. But um, certainly uh, Aiden Clark, who was the elementary school student uh, who died at the scene, our condolences to the family. Um, you know, it just, again, it's, re it's reignited the school bus seatbelt debate. NAPT weighed in just days after. Uh, Molly McGee Hewitt, is, who is the CEO and executive director of NAPT, wrote a letter to an open letter to members um, and really asking the feds for further clarification. As, as we know, NAPT and the National School Transportation Association for years have been asking for more clarity. We know that NHTSA requires lap shoulder belts on all small school buses because the crash forces for, on those vehicles are more similar to what we'll see in some of our passenger vehicles, smaller. Uh, when it comes to the larger buses, of course, compartmentalization is there, right? You know, the high seat backs, the cushion seat backs. But as over and over again, NTSB investigations have shown, 
compartmentalization fails in a side impact or a rollover. And we, we had a rollover in Ohio again. So, uh, you know, definitely uh, looking for more clarification. We know that NASDIPS has come out and just has the position that where feasible, uh, school districts should just implement them. Um, but I know that there are um, differing opinions on that in the industry, but certainly this great debate uh, is back to the, the front of the headlines. Yeah, it's really tragic, Ryan. I know we we have seen definitely some accidents over the years that have really kind of galvanized the industry around seatbelt usage. And we really haven't talked about it a whole lot lately. I mean, a lot of the fatalities are always illegal passing fatalities. I feel like we deal with a lot of the loading and unloading zone. It's very rare that we see a really big accident like this. Obviously, we saw one uh, where a vehicle struck a bus that's being uh, investigated by NTSB because it, I think when we had talked, you said that they're always looking for abnormal crash situations where something happens, they want to study it, right? Yeah, well, ones that, yeah, ones they've never studied before. Yeah. So, so like what the one you're referring to was a uh, uh, a legal passing, basically, where a 17 year old motorist was driving along, didn't see apparently the school bus stop in front of him, uh, and tried to veer out of the way, went right, still struck the back bumper, glancing blow, and then hit the student and and, and killed her. Um, you know, and and you know, I know you mentioned illegal passing, but you know, like what we saw in uh, what also happened last Tuesday a student in Kansas was hit by a school bus and killed. And still there's more school buses. If you look at uh, the the breadth of the Kansas school bus loading and unloading survey, the national survey that first the Kansas Department of Transportation did, and then the Kansas Department of Education, their school bus unit has picked up um, a couple decades ago. Um, there's still more deaths that happen at the hands of a, of a school bus, either the student school bus or another one. So, Definitely the, the danger zone seems to be where this, the industry has focused um, lately, but it just takes one of these crashes to then just shine a light again. And of course, the national media, the first questions I, I saw when I was watching the press conference with the sergeant of the Ohio uh, State Patrol, um, they were asking, were there seatbelts on the school buses? He said, no. Um, we know Ohio is not one of those states that requires them. We have seen a lot of school districts um, in whether it be, you know, Ohio, um, certainly in other states that have voluntarily um, added this, um, you know, in the Cleveland area, especially in, in Ohio, that's where there's been more seatbelt interest. Uh, Avon Lakes schools, uh, they actually had a pilot program that they, they implemented in 2019. Interestingly enough, their latest school bus purchase, though, they did not specify seatbelts. There are several other school districts in the area of Cleveland that are looking at it currently. Um, but what we know is that this Northwestern local schools, uh, Springfield, Ohio, is actually where they're, they're based. Again, about you know 30 miles northeast of Dayton. They did not have seatbelts. So certainly we're going to likely see this topic at the NAPT conference when it returns in November. Yeah, I mean, Ryan, it brings me back to SC and Expo in Indianapolis, where we have the live crash test demonstration that we host at the Safeguard IMMI facility. And they had set up uh, with us to really demonstrate what would happen in a rollover situation. And really, they've got crash test dummies within the bus. They flip the bus on the side and we look at the outcome of belted versus unbelted passengers. And what are those outcomes? Right. And so I think it's a very striking thing when you see an accident like that happen. The audience gasps. Right. It's just like do it. But when it actually happens with a bus full of kids, I mean, my God, man, this is a, it is a really big deal. And uh, it's just guys, I mean, I don't read the story. It's on stnonline.com. More, more details are going to come out about this, but I mean, it is a really tragic outcome. And anytime there's injuries, fatalities, a bus flipping, I mean, this is a serious accident and seriously got major implications for what's going to happen in Ohio. Um, and I think there's going to 
you know, there's going to be a lot of answers that are, that are going to need to be made from a safety perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, we definitely hang our hat as an industry on being the safest industry uh, in terms of commercial transportation of, of passengers. And we're definitely transporting more people than any other major uh, form of transportation combined in North America. So the burden is on us as an industry to advocate for safer outcomes for our students and seatbelts. Clearly we've seen demonstrate safer outcomes. And so this, again, it takes a tragedy for it to move the needle. Uh, you know, and we've seen legislation be put up and they get struck down and it really becomes a monetary discussion then, right? Can the district afford or can the state afford to pay for seatbelts on all the buses within the state? Is it only on new buses? Do they have to be retrofitted? There's all this kind of conversation that happens and and people say, oh, we'll just put seatbelts on. It's not so simple, right? It has to do with the subfloor, has to do with the engineering of the vehicle. There's a lot of other factors that need to be thought of. And then, you know, kind of things temper down and, you know, what are the outcomes? But we've definitely seen things happen over the years that really have moved the needle for this. So I'm, I'm, we're going to keep a real close eye on it, Ryan. I know, I'm sure you've got some reaction on this. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know, and something to, to not be lost in this whole thing, injuries, you know, students are injured in school bus crashes all the time whether they have seatbelts or not. Now, it's what we've seen with a lot of the studies is, um, you know, with seatbelts, students are a lot more apt to be able to walk away from a crash. They still might have some injuries, but the severity tends to be less. And when you mentioned the IMI crash tests that have been done at STN Expo Indy, you know, those crash test dummies that you mentioned, those are equipped with sensors. So they're able to look at the data from those dummies and see where the injuries would have taken place if it was a a live student. And and when you watch the video and the unbelted dummies, um, especially, you can see them thrown about um, and you can see just, just watching the video, you can just um, imagine some of just some traumatic or or even fatal injuries that could occur. Um, And, you know, we know that there's been several school bus crashes just over the past couple months, um, where there was a rollover in Washington State in July, forty-five children were on board. That, that was a rollover. Um, thankfully, um, only minor injuries were reported. So um, it's really a balancing act, and realizing and, and not losing sight of the injuries, but also um, you know focusing the light on school bus um, transportation for a variety of reasons. You know the the most federally regulated vehicle on the road. Certainly, uh, you know, you can get hurt in a school bus, um, but you factor in the training, training of the driver, training of the, of the attendants, if there's any on board, certainly if there's seatbelts, uh, video cameras, all these things together really, you know, give the detail on why school bus safety um, is, is so paramount and, and, and so important and, and so real. Um, you know, there's still a handful of kids that are killed a year, but we know that many more are injured, but still things, you know, are, are better than what they used to be. Um, and that's what we always need to keep in mind as an industry and try to shine the light on that. Because anytime one of these injuries happen, we know that the local and national media are going to seize on it. Um, and unfortunately sensationalism can occur. So it's, you know, it comes back to what are you doing in your operation? What are you doing locally to get the word out and share with the community, the media, you know, what you are doing as a school district or a school bus company to affect school bus safety? Certainly, if you have seatbelts, talk about them, you know, show them, bring them the media out to, to, to show how they work. Um, you know, but we know that it's only as good as the training also that you're providing the, the students and the usage policy as well. So, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, what comes out of this. Um, I have not seen anything from NTSB about investigating this crash. They've done a lot of these rollovers. So again, I, like I mentioned, they like to look at types of crashes they have not studied before. They've studied these types, um, but, you know, would not be surprised to see um, some legislation coming out of Ohio. Yeah, I mean, another thing, Ryan, that jumps into my mind is just based on the circumstance, an oncoming vehicle swerves into your lane, the bus swerves out of the way. Does it have electronic stability control? You know, we've done demonstrations with OEMs where, you know, curbing around corners, 
when you have electronic stability control engaged, that bus is significantly more stable versus when you don't have it. So my guess is this was probably an older bus that did not have electronic stability control. And potentially if the bus did, could the driver have recovered from the veering? Because it was a sudden veering that occurred. And, you know, the bus has a significant amount of rock when you, when you jerk that wheel and then they probably jerked it back, lost control, flipped the bus. And it is hard to flip a bus. I mean, it takes a lot of force. So, you know, and I'm not sure what the road conditions were, or the grade of the road or things like that, which again, more will come out. But first thing that jumps into my mind is based on the outcome, could electronic stability control have had a better outcome for the driver to be able to maintain control of the vehicle. Absolutely. And, you know, we know it was a 2016 model uh, school bus, uh, so likely did not have um, electronic stability control or any of the other advanced driver assistance systems that we've seen in, in, in later models. In terms of the road, there was a, a slight curve just by looking at the, the media reports. There was a slight curve uh, that it looked like the school bus had just come out of. Uh, but no hill. Um, it looked like there, it was a clear, sunny day. Uh, you know, middle of August, late August in Ohio, uh, first day of school. So it seemed the conditions um, were, were, were fine. Uh, but a lot will come out about, you know, why the, the driver of the minivan crossed the yellow line into the path of the school bus. We know that Hermanio Joseph, he's 35 years old. He was charged with aggravated vehicular homicide. It's a fourth degree felony uh, there in Clark County, Ohio. So he faces a, a six to 12 months in prison and a fine of up to $5,000. So certainly does not sound like the penalty fits the crime of killing a kid. Um, but certainly more will come out about, you know, what exactly happened. Was he grabbing a phone? Was he playing with the, the dial on his radio? What happened? Likely distraction that unfortunately that, you know, again, driver distraction is likely the, the, the cause of this. It seems to be, you know, over and over again. Yeah, I mean, with school bus driver training, that's where this kicks in, right? It's such a split second decision that occurred, right? I know we talk about training as being a really big thing, but this is almost like you're just reacting at that point. It just mentally, you just have subconsciously, you're kicking in on the training. So, so Ryan, uh, looks like we have some breaking news. Like while we're recording this podcast, Governor Mike DeWine from Ohio addresses if school buses should have seatbelts after the deadly crash. So in Ohio, school buses are not required to have seatbelts. And Governor Mike DeWine went on to say, all thoughts go out to the families that have been impacted. Let's take this tragedy as horrible as it is and use that as the push to look at whether there are other things we can do to make our transportation and our buses safer, end quote. And also statistically in Ohio and other state, this is a very, very safe form of transportation. He went on to tell the public and really kind of identified that he didn't want this to impact parents thinking they should take children off school buses, that it is the safest way to get kids to and from school. And really, you know, we want to see how the state of Ohio responds. And we really think that they're going to put together a uh, working group from what it looks like from this press release and really take a deep look at adding seatbelts potentially to school buses in the state of Ohio. So, We'll see what the outcome of that assembly is in that conversation uh, and that working group. But I feel like, again, these types of tragedies really evoke a reaction. It's obviously very personal to the parents, to the students, to the administration, and people do care. Now, who's going to pay for student butts on school buses? That's to be seen. But this is uh, kind of some breaking news for you guys. So I want to include that and share with you to kind of further Ryan and I's conversation today. Really wish the best for the families and, you know, our condolences absolutely to the, to the child's family that lost their life and uh, absolutely tragic situation and never good to have this highlighted in the media. And, you know, I think it becomes, what can we learn from this? How can we become better? What are the outcomes? So we'll keep reporting on it, guys, and uh, and take it from there. But yeah, I, I believe that 
we all can learn a lot from these situations and we'll keep absorbing it and talking about it through the conferences in the magazine on the website. So please uh, stay on stnonline.com for everything happening uh, regarding this story and developing stories uh, during school startup guys. So we'll, uh, we'll keep you posted on everything. All right. Um, just a second. We're talking with Doug Campbell from safely. He is talking a lot about safety, but before we get to that, we got a message from TransFinder. Well, the votes are in and STN Expo attendees have spoken. TransFinder was overwhelmingly selected as the best software and best hardware for 2023 at STN Expo in Reno, Nevada. Yes, you heard that right. For the first time ever, TransFinder received the Innovation Choice Award for best hardware. And for the second year in a row, TransFinder has won the best software award, adding to numerous past awards transfinder has won for its software products transfinders move into hardware was driven by client demand transfinder now provides the tablet the mounts the card reader and more as part of its one partner one solution approach guys you can learn more by visiting transfinder.com or calling them at 800-373-3609 or email them at getplus at transfinder.com and make sure you put STN podcast in the subject line. All right, guys, really excited to get our next guest up on the podcast. We have Doug Campbell. He is with Safe Fleet. He's the national account manager of School Bus. Doug and I have known each other a long time. He's a veteran of the industry. Doug, welcome to the podcast, man. It's your first time joining us here on uh, School Transportation Nation, I think. Yes, thank you, Tony. Good to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got a lot going on in the uh, in the realm of safety and wanted to uh, get you on here for a conversation to talk a little bit. And before we dive too deep into kind of uh, the safety discussion, I want to get a little more flavor from you on for those that don't know who Safe Fleet is. Can you give a little background on that and kind of what is your role? I know you got the title I ripped off there, but like, what do you do at Safe Fleet all day long? Yeah, so thank you. So uh, most of your audience knows us as specialty manufacturing, Transpect, and or Sayon. And we currently supply the majority of the school bus industry with stop arms, roof hatches, crossing gates, Sayon interior and exterior camera systems, DVRs, safety equipment like that. One thing I want to be sure to mention is Sayon and all their wonderful camera technologies is part of the Safe Fleet group, part of the Safe Fleet family. A little history. So Safe Fleet was formed back in the early 2000s when it was just specialty and transpect. We were combined and then Sam was added later in. Fast forward, you know, 18, 20 years plus, Safe Fleet now has uh, 14 divisions around the country. We've got three in Europe as well. So today, Safe Fleet designs, manufactures, sells, and installs safety products, solutions, and technologies for a really broad variety of fleet vehicles. So of course, school bus, transit bus, but if you look at a commuter rail car, a cable truck, a food service truck, police, fire, ambulance, any kind of fleet vehicle is likely to have our safety products or technologies on them. And really the goal of the company as a whole is keeping operators and pedestrians safe while making fleets more effective. So that's kind of the, the overarching uh, review of what, what Safe Fleet is. I've been with the company 18 years. My focus really is on managing OEM accounts, dealer and distributor sales, and really focusing on safety and technologies. And, and lately, of course, a lot of work on the epidemic of illegal passing of the stop school bus, which is really the main topic uh, we'd like to talk about today. Yeah, so go ahead. Let's dive a little deeper in that. Obviously, school startup is kicking into gear for a lot of districts and private fleets around the country. And, you know, we have a lull in the action when uh, when maybe summer school, maybe it's a little reduced. But, you know, it has really gotten to a point that, you know, it's either the carrot or the stick, right? In terms of 
deploying camera technology or deploying uh, with ticketing or deploying something that's a little more active where it actually addresses, you know, a warning to either the driver or the students um, and automating the process a little bit, right? So there's a variety of different technologies that have been introduced in the market. Obviously, stop arm technology, you're dealing with lighting, illumination in different conditions. So there's a lot of factors that play into this, but it, it has not necessarily, at least according to the, the NASDAQ study, we see the numbers necessarily increasing. And now I can only assume that could be maybe things being underreported, but regardless, 40 million, I think it was 43 million was the last count uh, in terms of the extrapolated number of illegal passes. I mean, that is just an astronomical number, Doug. I mean, what's your reaction to kind of the bigger issue and what are you doing to kind of tackle this kind of gorilla? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a very scary statistic. I think it was actually 45 million a year was the latest NASDAQ survey, which is just, it's horrifying. And as you know, Tony, I mean, tragically, that has resulted in multiple fatalities over the last several years. So, you know, we all have to do more and we want to do our part being a safety based company. And really going back several years ago, you know, safely made it one of our top priorities to help reduce death and injuries related to the illegal passing of a stop school bus. And so we've been we've been thinking about this issue, working towards this issue. And as of late, uh, we've developed this what we're calling the illegal passing technology suite which really combines current proven technologies in our most comprehensive holistic solution that we've ever offered, right? So it really is this holistic approach. And as you said, there's lots of different pieces that people are working on, but in our minds, at least, this broader comprehensive review of multiple products and deployed together is probably the best approach, at least that we can think of for right now. And really we look at that as far as three steps and four products. So step one for us, is really making people aware that the bus is stopping or stopped. And we do that with two devices. One is called our driver alert device. So this is an LED sign that's mounted on the back door of the bus. And when the bus is slowing down, the LED sign reads caution stopping, right? In, in bright LED letters. When the bus stops, the sign goes to stop, do not pass. So you've given a very clear message to the driver behind the bus what to do, don't pass the bus. Working in conjunction with that, the second product is our latest high visibility stop arm. So this is our proven Defender composite stop arm. It's got a highly reflective decal, strobing LED lights, but we've taken the word stop and we've now illuminated that with bright white LED lights from behind. So you've made it much more visible in all lighting conditions from different distances. So now you've got that, that bright visible sign working with the driver alert device to make the bus uh, more visible and let people know that it's stopping or stop. So that's step one. Step two, which we really think is the most uh, important step, is proactive notification of imminent danger, giving the students three to four seconds to respond. So that, that kind of sounds like a mouthful, but I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's so important to hear this. So it's proactive notification of imminent danger, giving the students three to four seconds to respond. So we do this with our predictive stop arm. So the predictive stop arm uses radar, predictive analytics, and AI technology. And, and, the, and the simplified version of how this works is when the bus is slowing down, well, let me back up here for a second. There are two radars mounted below the stop arm on the street side of the bus towards the lower skirt, one forward facing, one rear facing. So the bus slows down, it starts to scan the road, three lanes wide, a thousand feet in both directions, and it begins to determine if the vehicle is going to stop in time or legally pass the stop school bus. When the bus stops, it goes into predictive mode, and it will then, in real time, then predict if a vehicle will stop or not. If it determines that a vehicle will not stop in time, it will give clear spoken word to the students using the word stop, get back in a very loud volume, giving them three to four seconds to stop and either stay on the side of the bus on the curb or stop across the street, but step back from danger. So again, it's that proactive notification, kind of shouting at them, if you will, stop, get back. So you've given them clear direction on, on what to do. Again, stay on the curb, stay across the street, don't cross. And it really is the only proactive notification system out there. Again, we want to be, you know, punitive is important. And I'll talk about that in a second, but proactive to us is key. And I've used the story before. If my son was still of school age and riding the bus 
and he was getting off and on the bus. And let's say he was uh, struck by the motorist and the motorist got a fine. My son still got hit. So the fine is important, but I don't want my son to get hit in the first place. So we want to be proactive in making sure we keep kids out of harm's way to begin with. So this system is on a thousand buses all around the country. It's been on uh, these buses working all day, every day during school. It's been effective and useful and quietly doing its job in the background. We also have training videos that we've deployed along with the launch of this that, you know, it educates the driver, uh, the student, the parent, the administrator on what to expect and what not to expect. It's not going to make you breakfast, but you want to understand, you know, what it's going to do. So that's a really key piece of the illegal passing technology suite is that proactive notification. So step three is helping enforce proper driver behavior. So we have stop arm cameras. These are high definition cameras, uh, one forward facing, one rear facing. And when the violation takes place, of course, it captures the data and makes it available for downloading. And so law enforcement can then issue a citation. So these three steps, you know, again, heightened visibility, proactive notification, and proper uh, enforcing proper driver behavior. We think that's a pretty solid, comprehensive, proactive solution that people can deploy now, right? Because as you know, and we think we've talked about this in other conversations, NHTSA is now studying the, the issue of, of illegal passing of a stop school bus. And through the Stop for School Bus Act, which is made into law, I guess a year and a half ago, it mandated that NHTSA study this issue holistically. And so they're also studying these technologies I just talked about. And they're studying other technologies, but it's going to take them, I think, another 18 months to come out with the recommendations to Congress on, on what are the best practices. Is it technologies? Is it enforcement? Is it education, fines, et cetera? So what do we do in the meantime? Well, we're trying to educate people uh, on the illegal passing technology suite. A good example of that is, is the Flagler School District in Florida. So they've, they've implemented these technologies. They see the value of the predictive stop arm and the stop arm cameras. Uh, it's raised student transportation awareness. It, it's prioritized school bus safety for the district and the county. And of course, the violations are being reported, which is aiding law enforcement uh, for intervention. So people are, are realizing that the technology works. It's beneficial. It, it's, it's of good use. We just have to get the word out there to do more now because uh, we don't need another another tragedy to take place before we start deploying these technologies that, again, are readily available and, and are proven. So that's that's kind of our legal passing technology suite and, and why we feel uh, near and dear about trying to adjust this issue as soon as we can. Yeah, I know I always run into you at the NASDIPS conference, which is the uh, the National State Directors Association. I know you work real closely with them to make sure they have a clear understanding of what all these products can do within the state, right? Because every state is different in terms of what they allow or don't allow. And the state directors are obviously really involved in the illegal passing study specifically. So, you know, can you talk to a little bit about how you work with that association specifically and kind of provide education to the state level? Yeah, and we work with NASDAQ and NSTA and, and, and all the industry organizations really on, on just education during webinars, you know, during panel discussions, just trying to make sure that, that these organizations, you know, know of all the different tools available to them to address this issue. Um, we spend a lot of time with them at different conferences, uh, and it really is just, you know, every opportunity we get in any kind of format we get to keep impressing uh, upon them, you know, what's available and whether it's really our technology or someone else's technology, right? We all want the same thing, right? To reduce death and injury related to illegal passing of a stop school bus. So we just try to keep pushing the message. We need to do something and we need to do something now. And we think we have solutions for that, but we need to hurry up and do it and, and not wait for the next tragedy. So it really is an ongoing effort. Um, again, whether it's with NSTA, the contractor group, or with NASDIPS, or with its NHTSA, the Highway Administration, um, we're trying to hit it on all fronts. We're talking to our OEM partners on a regular basis about these issues as well. Uh, we've got boots on the ground uh, talking to districts and, and dealers and, and just trying to do a, a, a really broad push to, uh, to get our messaging out there and make sure people are aware uh, of, of what can be done. And again, the sooner we do something about it or, or deploy these proven technologies, the better, right? Absolutely. So is there a place that people can go to find out more about the resources that you offer? So the best way is to either get a hold of me directly at, at doug.campbell at safely.net 
or go to our website at safefleet.net and they can find all the different technologies there uh, for school bus and for transit bus and other vehicles. Uh, but there's product pages there, there's testimonials, but all the information is on our website, again, safefleet.net. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing a little bit about some of the safety technologies that Safe Fleet has to offer. A really important topic these days with school startup and, you know, keeping our kiddos safe and uh, great to have uh, the proactive technology as well as the uh, stop arm enforcement technology and lighting. It's just such a wide breadth of, of technology to consider. And I'm sure when you stack all that together, it's very powerful. So uh, definitely uh, excited to have you come on and share so thank you for being here, Doug. Thank you very much, Tony. My pleasure. Great conversation. Want to uh, tee up Miss Taylor Ekbatani and Donna Hackett, Transportation Supervisor at Pembroke Central School District in New York, the TransFinder Top Teams winner. Going to hear all about what it is to be a top team, guys. A really wonderful conversation ahead of you. Take it away, Taylor. Hello, Nation. We have another amazing guest with us on today. So I'm very excited to introduce Donna Hackett. She actually just recently retired. She was the transportation supervisor for Pembroke Central School District in New York. So welcome, Donna, all the way from uh, the other coast. Absolutely. Hello. <laughs> It's great to have you on. And I know some of you guys might be familiar with Donna's name. She was one of the top transportation teams by TransFinder. So she was out in Reno, uh, big lunch and learn, big session there. And so we'll dive into that a little bit later. But kind of starting the discussion, Donna, can you kind of talk about your career, how you got started, you know, in the industry and, and some big highlights that have stood out to you? Sure, sure. Well, as most transpor school transportation folks, we don't aspire to get into this industry. It happens per chance. My per chance was a landlady at the time that was a school bus driver. I had my first little peanut and I was struggling with working full time at Marriott as a bookkeeper and seeing my baby grow up. And she says, oh, Donna, you drive fire trucks. You love kids. Why don't you drive school bus? And I was kind of a little bit arrogant back there at age 24 and said, oh, but I have a four-year degree in business and accounting and economics and a school bus driver. Well, I did it. I jumped in, you know, definitely, definitely a leap of faith and could not ever leave it. Um, I drove school bus for 13 years. My current supervisor retired and my business official said, hey, Donna, you got a background in management. You know the industry. You've been here for 13 years. What do you think? And I was just like terrified. We had a very divided bus garage. They had merged two garages years back. Um, two schools merged and it never melded. And I was just terrified thinking, well, I'm on, you know, half of the people here will not accept me. And then, you know, like I said, you just, you really put your heart into it and say, no, my husband told me, um, hey, Donna, you love bus driving. And I was like, of course I do. And he says, why don't you make other people love it as much as you do? And that was my total motivation. Thank you, Bruce. Um, he was phenomenal in giving me that advice. And that's where it started was just taking my little realm of the school bus world in my little bus and sharing it with others. I was very blessed to have been very early on involved in our state organization, New York Association for Pupil Transportation. They started really building me and, and grooming me and giving me all this data and information. And as I got that, I learned, I met other people in the industry and gleaned all of their stuff um, and, and truly brought Pembroke to the place that it is right now, um, where we are an amazing team like we have never been before. That's what's brought us to the national um, accreditation is our department all filled in this you know, 20 something question survey and, and told how they love us and, and how we have really pulled it together. And, you know, we're a very um, fluid team. We take a lot of information in. People don't get bummed out when we don't take their suggestion. You know, we're always kind of building. And, and now we have huge support in our schools because we've informed them over 20 years of what we do and who we are. And I think that's what's built us as well. Our community understands us. Our building principals understand us. Everybody's on the same page. And 
I think the more we know about one another, the more we respect one another. Bus drivers aren't, you know, oh, just the bus drivers. <laughs> they're the bus drivers and, and they're responsible and they're, um, you know, very good at what we do. I have said it. And um, my New York constituents will say, oh, there goes Donna again, telling us she's the best apartment in the state. And I said, well, we are. <laughs> so it's huge um, to have a team effort behind it. Um, we have a vast array of drivers from, you know, one year to 33 years of, of experience. We have brand new mechanics, um, you know, and all of those people, monitors that come in and we are all you know, our new supervisor, Julie Lawson, has carried through that. And we'll get into that later on as to, no, we do group efforts. No, you can't make everybody happy. And sometimes I say, do I have to play boss right now? Because I will. <laughs> but I'd rather we all came to a consensus on things. And so it's give and take. I give, they give, I take, they take. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the bottom of our success in these 20 years of building that. Yeah. And so by, you know, being involved at the TransFinder top transportation team, you had to put yourself out there in this very vulnerable, you know, position, take this criticism, you know, because obviously there's going to be good and, and bad that comes with it. So what was that process kind of like for you and what made you want to open yourself up to, you know, accept this? Well, actually, we had been offered this in the past and I was like, no way. My department is not, we are not cohesive. Um, we are strong personalities that aren't afraid to say it like it is. But then these last couple of years, um, COVID actually brought us together in a huge way. Our district was very on board of we're going to deliver meals. We're going to deliver papers. We're going to deliver book bags. We're going to, we are all coming together. Um, we came to school before anybody else in the state. Um, we did whatever we had to do to make it work to get our kids back in school. And our drivers took that very personal because those are their kids, their neighbors, their relatives. And we under, we felt anyways, it was best to get our children because we're a very rural area. So if they're not at school, they're home by themselves. And the nearest neighbor could be a couple acres away or a couple miles away. So um, that when we learned to work together during the COVID craziness for us, it really started solidifying us. And um, in NIAPT, I won a state award that we they presented to me in my superintendent's office with my staff. It was the most personal, beautiful, oh my goodness, I about fainted. Um, it was just so awesome to get us all together. And then we took on this little motto. One of the girls was a softball coach, one of our drivers, and they used to have this on her shirt. So we made these two banners for the bus garage and my superintendent office. It sounds a little, you know, boasting, but I took this on in 2020 and it says, to play with us, you've got to be smart. To keep up with us, you've got to be quick. But to beat us, you got to be kidding. <laughs> We're a team and we all embrace this. And I've got to tell you, no, we all don't see eye to eye. But for the most part on the road, we are the best team. And it's just exciting to have little Pembroke because we're small. You know, we're a very rural district, but, you know, with a staff of 32, sometimes it gets confusing even getting that few of people together. And when we did, it just it, it just flew. And so when the staff wanted to do this survey, it was it was just like my heart was overwhelming happy. Um, I could not believe they were getting on each other. Hey, did you fill out your survey yet? Have you put in, you know, we got to put it out there. It's about time we tell people how we do things and they took pride in how we do things. And that's where it's sold is, is their, mm -hmm. their love for what we do as well. Yeah, I love that. And you guys were recognized for the hundred or fewer employees category. So they kind of had, uh, you know, two different categories, a smaller and then a larger kind of operations. But you guys also took home highest score, which TransFinder announced during their lunch and learn session. So I think it kind of took everyone by surprise. I don't think you were expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, oh, my goodness, we wish we could have brought the whole team to, to Reno, Nevada. Uh, you would have seen our absolute, yes, we got this. Um, because we really believe that we have gleaned over 20 years, all these other 
great things from other schools and made it fit at Pembroke. Each thing may not fit at your school, but you modify it. You not afraid to change. They know when I come back from a conference or when I did come back from a conference or a seminar or a meeting or a podcast, they'd be like, oh no, brace yourself. Who knows what she's going to do to us now? (laughs) But we did it. And it was always exciting. And always, I always say we got to partner up and you've always got to reach a higher level. And oh my word, have we done it from our, our physical bus garage? I mean, If you looked at us, a lot of people walk in and go, wow, this looks like home. And that's what it is. Some of us, I'm here a lot of hours, you know. And so we've got the fridge and the stove and we do barbecues and, and, you know, and it's mainly here at work. We don't eat tea and crumpets outside of work together that much. Some of us do in little little pods. (laughs) But on the road, we pull it together, whether it's bad winter weather in Western New York, whether it's COVID, whether it's the first day of school, you know, whatever happens, I just never am alone. Never. Mm -hmm. I've always got help. And that's, that's what we're doing with Julie, my, my predecessor now. She's, you know, not alone. Um, I'm not leaving until we get this figured out and she's comfortable. And and then I just want to drive the bus. (laughs) That's my goal. <laughs> oh, so you're going to retire and then go back to school bus driving? Oh, okay. Absolutely. I took my first field trip last week and I think my face still hurts from smiling. I just had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely feel your excitement through the screen. So I hope, oh. you know, people can hear it too because it's there. Oh man, it's so true. It I, you know, 33 years in the business and I still love it. I still want to be here. My husband says I stink at retirement because I've been at work <laughs> day, you know, and I'm just like, well, just a couple hours. <laughs> I know I email you and you're like, I'm retired, but I'm here. I'm like, okay. <laughs> My superintendent just said that. He goes, Donna, I really want you to be at the superintendent opening conference day. And I was like, well, of course I'll be there. You know, he goes, I've got some good things to tell us. And, you know, even then I'm retired. They still want to share the good stuff. That's a beautiful thing. You know, Mm -hmm. it really is. So now with your predecessor, you know, how are you kind of training or bringing her up? You know, how are you kind of keeping this cohesive culture, transportation team, you know, all together through this leadership change? Because that's a lot for a team to go through. It is huge. And our team was very afraid that we would hire somebody from without of the district that didn't have our same ideals. And we were all like, "Uh uh-uh, we, it's not that we don't want change. We do want change, but there's some basic things we do this way for a reason. And we've established it. And we really didn't want to explain it again to somebody new. But when Julie stepped up and she's one of our drivers for 26 years. And I'm like, Julie, why didn't you tell me this a couple of years ago? We could have started training you then. But her heart is there and her determination. And and when she says, I want a couple more awards on the wall like we already have, you know, it's just that kind of heart was like, OK, then I'm going to dig in. So right now I'm coming in six to nine every morning and we're going through stuff and we're doing we're learning. She's learning Transfinder and field trips and all that kind of stuff. And um, we're pulling it together and we're going to continue this path. And I believe it'll be for the whole school year because it's just a huge she just got her 19. A certification or is in the process of getting it. Um, So she's doing all of those steps to get to the point of her feeling confident in this position. Um, Like I said, it takes TransFinder. It takes our IC buses. It takes 247, our camera people, to explain their part of our industry to us. And these are the people I'm introducing Julie to. And um, we truly, we're sticking together. Um, I try to not talk so much when she's around. (laughs) Um, I try to wait for her to ask a question. And then I, of course, give my answer because I love telling what we do and how we do it. Mm -hmm. And she's super, super open to not only taking us to the next level, but learning this base level super strong um, because your base is what's going to build on. And and that's what we want. We want that strong foundation and rock solid. And then we can take it to other places as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stick around. Definitely. We're trying to establish a part-time position in my office, in the office, (laughs) excuse me, um, (laughs) because it's a one-man show. And for 20 years, I've been hanging on and, you know, the 10 hours days and weekends and nights and all that. And it's, it is truly too much. So now we're showing the district why we need somebody in there just a couple hours a day to do certain things. And we're deciding what those certain things are. And one of them is going to be, I'll be there 
you know, six to nine, and then she comes in eight to four. Um, that will be much more manageable because those long hours, even me, I got tired. <laughs> so it's definitely something we want to help resolve for future, you know, super. Yeah. So, you know, when training, Julie, what were some of the top points that you're like, okay, this is where we need to start? Or was it leadership? Because, you know, you came from a school bus driver to into the leadership position. So you have a lot of background and, and knowledge that you could share with her on how to make that transition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we um, definitely, it's a step when you, when you make, um, a vertical leap in your in your organization, it's tough to go from school bus driver to supervisor. I went through that 20 years ago and some people did not take too kindly to it initially, but you prove yourself that your heart is into it and you're in for the good of everybody. Julie is wonderful in saying, I have this idea, let's pitch it to the whole team and see what their feelings are on it. Because honestly, we don't see the whole picture until you talk to everybody. How is this going to affect the subs? How is it going to affect the mechanics? How is it going to affect our special ed drivers? You know, everybody has such a different perspective and, you know, uh, part of this game that you really want everybody to talk about it. And then you want everybody to understand what went in the decision. Because sometimes you can tell one person one thing and then they pitch it to somebody else differently. So we like to have a group meeting and say, guys, this is what we're thinking. This is what we're doing. Hash it out. And we're still going to play boss and make the final decision. And that's the part that Julie's Julie's working on right now. Um, our first thing, though, was definitely getting we were into full swing of summer. We still had routes going. So she had to just come alongside of me and see what I was doing to make those routes happen and what, how they ran and all that. So again, TransFinder was absolutely integral. They are my secretary right now because they take care of field trips. They take care of, you know, my mechanics have service finder. So all of our, that inventorying and budgeting and things like that are taken care of. When I have staff information, she's like, all right, where do I find, you know, how many miles we went last year? Okay. Now I go to Zonar. So those different entities that we have teamed up with and really solidified our usage with over the years, that's our nuts and bolts as well. We have to have those people. And for us, we chose these vendors because I'm like this little Excel spreadsheet person and I put all these parameters down. Then I put all the lists down of what, who has what and how much it's going to cost and what their support is like. And for Pembroke, these vendors have risen to the top and we have stuck with them. I still look at new ones. Um, you have to be responsible and look at the other bus vendors, look at the other camera vendors, mirrors, whatever you're talking about. Um, so this is where Julie's going to start. She's absorbing now is where do we get all that information that truly makes us run every day? How do we interface with the parents? Um, this is a new thing with stop finder that we're doing through TransFinder. Literally, we are just pushing that out to the parents. The app is going out and, oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> it truly is. I mean, this, you can't get bored in this industry. You just can't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So before we wrap up, what is your last kind of advice, you know, to some school districts who who want to be, you know, a top transportation team? What is something you would say to them and and how can you build them up or build up a culture? Ours was definitely as hard as it is for this little one man show to leave the office you have to get out and talk to other people. The networking, I know that's an old term, but it is something that is crucial. I I constantly have a network of people that I call when I have a question and that call me when they have a question. The newbies are, you know, now I, I'm still getting text messages from folks saying, hey, Donna, how do we do this? And I got my not allowable pupil decimal and what's the best thing to do with that? And we exchange information all the time. Me as a, as a veteran now, I want to look at the new and up and coming people like people looked at me. Um, We had two supervisors, one from Lancaster and Grand Island, that really saw that I have this crazy desire to do all this and pulled me into NIAPT real deep with the legislative, with the um, safety, with all these different poster contests and things like that. So I had to find out what is out there so I could bring it back and make us better and safer and excited about what we do. Um, You know, when you do a school bus rodeo, that is stinking and exciting to show your people how good they are out on that course, you know, and I'm just like, guys, you're outstanding and you don't even know it. So for me, 
people coming into the industry, get involved in your local, your regional chapters, your state chapters. I'm little Donna from Western New York and Pembroke, and I sat on our executive state board for nine years and was able to give advice and ask questions. Um, you have to be able to talk to DMV, SED, DOT when you have to, DEC, who knows, you know, all these entities pull into us and you can't just sit in your office and expect it all to just happen. You have to get out there and learn what's available to you. Um, my first year as a supervisor, I had somebody from our local college say, hey, I want to be a transportation supervisor. Can I job shadow you? And I'm like, girlfriend, I am in my first year of this. I don't even know what I'm doing. But if you want to come in and join my crazy, go ahead. And we had a blast. And she's just retiring I think this December. So we made it 20 wow. years, you know, um, that's what you got to do. You got to partner up, find the other entities. Oh, another thing, super important. Go to your own school board meetings. I went to every school board meeting twice a month for years to show them if they have a transportation question, they need to ask me. They need to come back and ask Donna Hackett. I don't want them to ask my business official. I don't want them to ask my resource officer because they don't quite understand what we do as well as we do. So I had to be this voice of the department. And so whenever there was a community problem, a, uh, you know, internal problem, whatever kind of thing, they said, oh, transportation, call Donna. You know, my principals would say, oh, sounds like transportation, call Donna. You know, you don't want somebody else speaking for you when they're just they're trying to do it well, but they don't know it well. So that's important to get yourself in the community and in your school established as the transportation guru. <laughs> you really need that. Um, I encourage my mechanics to come to meetings. So they're a face. We want to be a face with our board and with our community. Um, Julie and I will be, you know, we've already hit board meeting together and we're going to continue doing that because um you're the pro. And if you don't have the answer, don't be afraid to say, hold on, let me find out. Um, never be afraid to say, I don't know, but I will find it. Um, that's huge because your community depends on you. Your own staff depends on you. Your district depends on you. And even other communities around you, other schools, you know, when you start playing sports and stuff, you got to connect with them. So be that face that they know they can go to. Unfortunately, any time of any day. <laughs> They do contact you. So you have to know this is not a nine to five job. It's all year, every day, things happen and your heart just has to be in it. If it's not, you know, figure it out. Um, there was a time I'll get kind of personal because this is part of my success. Um, 14 years ago, I was 200 pounds. I had, you know, just the stress of everything was building up on me. And I partnered up with one of the drivers who is very healthy and she exercises and she eats right. And I said, Hey, how can you do this? You know, how do you do this? Will you bring this on? So she taught me a lot of stuff. We still exercise together most every day, bike riding or weights or something. So your personal health as a person in this position is vitally important, vitally important, because if I'm not strong mentally and physically, how do I lead other people? That to me seems like an oxymoron. <laughs> you know, I needed to be strong and that definitely helped my department. And um, she became our trainer. So, you know, it just, we're trying to spread that strength right through our whole department. Yeah, that's amazing. Donna, you are such a wealth of knowledge. I could listen to you all day talk. <laughs> and I just want to share with you guys and anybody that ever wants to contact me, Donna at Pembroke, I can get your name and numbers. I would never hesitate to encourage others. This is an exciting, exciting, always growing, always changing industry. And you just, you can't sit still even when you're retired. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and for sharing some of your knowledge uh, with our listeners. But yes. I wish you the best in, you know, retirement. I'm going to air quote oh. this because uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it's retirement too much. But uh, yeah, thank you so much again. Absolutely. Take care all. All right, guys. Special thanks. Ryan Gray, Taylor Equitani, Doug Campbell, Donna Hackett. Appreciate you joining the episode for a great conversation this week. Guys, we appreciate our sponsors, TransFinder, IC Bus, and Safely. Don't forget stnonline.com for all the news and analysis happening in the school transportation industry. As you go with school startup, guys, as you're a weekend, a month in, be safe out there. 
We love you. We really hope you listen to the podcast. Catch up on all the greatest news. It's on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to pods. Nation, we love you. We'll see you next week.